Good evening. Here's the news, the good news. Andy Murray, the ashes, a royal baby and a bit of sunshine. And tomorrow, what are predicted to be better growth figures than first feared. Like the sun coming out at last, good second quarter GDP figures should cheer most of us up. The only problem is that rather like the summer weather, there may still be thunderstorms ahead. Paul Mason has been trying to assess how strong the recovery really might be and whether, as the government puts it, the economy is being rebalanced towards exports, industrial production and long-term investment. Or are we repeating some of the mistakes of the past? Breakfast in Soho, London. At this cafe, they know all about economic recovery. It's a pop-up business using space in a late-night bar to serve English breakfast by day. And on most days, there's a queue. This is normally a bar, um, and I open at 10 o'clock and finish at 4. They start working at 4. And what's been the effect of doing that? The effect of doing it is really using a space where they're already paying rent and bills, whether they're open or closed. So we're optimising on the space and making more money um, and it's great marketing for the business it's a new clientele that we're attracting and how's it doing it's doing really well and um, we're number 10 on TripAdvisor out of 11 and a half thousand restaurants in london to you it may just look like carbohydrates to an economist this is great use of spare capacity two firms one space more jobs you're hiring i see uh, I'm, uh, actually, that's, Th that's the bar. The bar. So that's the bar. The bar's hiring. hiring. Yeah, okay. the bar's hiring. I mean, but one thing with hiring, actually, which is amazing, is that you've got a lot more choice. So many people are looking for work, but you're getting um, a huge range of qualifications. Quite often, a lot that are well overqualified because they're supplementing their income with a second job. So London's buzzing, but two or three hours away from here, the upturn does not look so sure. You can have breakfast, dinner and tea amid three very different economic stories, which is what I'm about to do. This map shows the growth in Britain's regions and nations since 2007. The average is 6% and the South East, South West, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland all grew by about that much. The underperformers were the North East, North West, West Midlands, Yorks and Humber and the East of England and the East Midlands was below 3%. But London is in a different class, clocking up 12% growth, double the average. The recovery was supposed to be led by industry and exports, but in Birmingham where I'm headed now, they know all too well how weak that's been. BSA Machine Tools was once an iconic British giant. Now it's down to 35 production workers. They are highly skilled, but look closely and the age profile tells the story. Apprentices, brand new, the majority of the skilled workforce over 60 and very few people in between. Here we would have had a tool room. The boss, who remembers the factory in his heyday, tells me over a working lunch, it's the shortage of skilled people that's holding back growth. Clearly, if I haven't got the skills, then I'm not able to, to grow. In this area, in particular, the skills issue is major. Uh, we've got a skills gap where um, new apprentices coming through uh, probably won't get there before the older workforce moves on. The other big issue is, of course, finance. This firm weaned itself off bank credit by cutting costs, delaying payments. Now they're ready to grow again, but access to finance is becoming critical. It enabled us to extract ourselves from the bank in terms of working capital, and that was fine. And that's a lot of companies have, have done that over time and are, and are reticent to go back to the banks. The problem is we're looking to export. When we export, you can't extract yourself from the bank. You need, extra, you need other facilities like documentary credits, letters of credit, uh, down payment guarantees and so on. So you can't get away from them altogether. And even that can be difficult when you're exporting. And exporting, of course, is very important to us. And it's stuff like this that worries economists. The fact that we're facing capacity constraints, even with much of the economy just ticking over. What I've just seen there in Birmingham is a great example of what they call the output gap and the lack of it. That is, when the economy starts to grow, the worry is that there isn't enough spare capacity, that is, ability to grow. And so, even in quite promising circumstances, what you get is a low growth recovery. 
And the further away you get from London, the more you start seeing the kind of excess capacity that we don't really want to have. Eccles in Salford contains some of the most deprived streets in Britain. Many of its shops are closed. We're going right. The unemployed advice centre, though, does a brisk trade, and the man who runs it is pessimistic about the kind of growth we're getting. Salford is a branch economy, and when companies close down or reduce, they chop the branches off first. Right. And Salford was chopped off a number of years ago, and the branches aren't grown back yet. Right. Poverty on this scale creates its own demand, but not the kind you'd ideally want to have. We are employing 13 people to improve the health of the people at the bottom. Which is very bad in a place like this. Horrendous. Why? Um, too many alcohol outlets, no cinemas, nothing in this area but 77 outlets here to buy or drink. Alcohol. 77 within 1,000 a metres. 77 shops selling alcohol within a one kilometre. Yeah. The longer I stayed in Eccles, the more I began to wonder what kind of growth it would need to lift this economy out of the world of loan sharks and cheap booze. Alec, we've been on the streets five minutes and it's obvious the level of deprivation. What kind of economic recovery would it take to feel it here? It would, it would be a massive thing, Paul. What you need is you need to bring real industry, but you'd also need to bring and train the, the generation that hasn't worked in a skilled industry. It's, it's doable, but you'd need, it would be need to be done, in my view, over probably five to ten years. Even if tomorrow we find growth on track for 1% or more, the challenge is great. So it's been breakfast in buzzing London, lunch at a factory where they can't grow because they can't find enough skilled workers, and tea, as we call it, here in Salford, where there's lots of spare capacity, people, closed shops, but it's very hard to see how 1% growth solves things. These we call structural problems in economics. There's always been wealth in the south and grit here, but once these streets felt wealthy too. Being here gives a whole new meaning to the term rebalancing. Paul Mason there, I'm joined by Bronwyn Curtis, former head of global research at HSBC and current vice chair of the Society of Business Economists, Dido Harding, who's CEO of Talk Talk, and Alistair Heath, who's editor of City AM. Let's begin with what's going right, which is a question we don't ask very often. <laughs> what is actually going right, do you think, now, if these growth figures are relatively good? Well, I think you have got growing businesses. I run one. Um, if you look in the papers this evening, you'll have seen several businesses reporting growing activity in my sector, in the digital world. But geographically, perhaps not in some of the areas that we're talking about. Well, ironically, my business is actually based in Salford. Um, so I would contend that there are growing high-tech businesses in the Manchester area that we should be very proud of as a country, rather than always looking to find the bad. I mean, what's interesting is maybe a year ago, some people were talking about maybe there could be a triple dip recession. Well, we didn't even have a double dip when the figures were, were revised. So have we turned some kind of big corner or not? I don't think we've turned a big corner. It's certainly nice to see positive growth, you know, and perhaps heading for 1%, but by this time in the cycle, you would hope that it was 2% plus, if not more. I mean, one of the things that's happening, of course, is that interest rates are really low. So the corporate sector, as we just talked about, is in quite good shape because they can borrow money cheaply and, you know, they can actually, you know, give something back to their shareholders and so on. But of course they're not investing and what we need to see is more investment coming through. So the, the economy is still unbalanced, we're not seeing enough exports, but it's better than it was. So we're just not at escape velocity, I think that's what the way I would right. put it. Right, I mean any growth is presumably good. Well, good I mean, news. The problem is you can get the wrong kind of growth and that's what we got for example during the bubble of the noughties. You had the very good GDP figures, every quarter was great, you know economists were jumping up and down with joy, the chance at the time was very happy, Gordon Brown, but it turned out that a lot of the growth was not real, it was a mirage and eventually it vanished and had to be liquidated. There was a lot of bad investments you know, because interest rates were wrong and so on. And my big worry right now is we're starting to see the wrong kind of growth again. We're seeing consumption, we're seeing debt fuel consumption, we're seeing the chance of promoting the housing market a little bit too much in my view. And you know, it's the wrong kind of growth. It's not growth 
because of exports, it's not because of investments, it's because of consumption, it's because of government consumption, private sector consumption, and it's because of leverage. What did, what did you make of, uh, I mean, that BSA story was very interesting, wasn't it? It was kind of obvious from Paul's report. You do see some people who are older and some people who are apprentices, and not many in the middle, and that is the living skills gap, isn't it? And it is a problem. I think the skills gap is a real challenge for all businesses, but it's something that we should ta tackle head on and really invest in ourselves. Um, I'd argue the biggest skills gap we have in the country is the digital skills gap. There are 14 million people in this country that don't know how to use the internet. Seven million people who have never used the internet. And yet, if we want to be an export-led economy, the digital exporting trade has to be our future. But that, uh, some parts of that are perhaps solvable quite quickly, but a lot of it, in terms of the apprenticeships and who's going to fit in between those who are over 60 and those who are under 20, that is going to take a very long well, time to solve. I guess it. maybe I'm ever the optimist. I run a, <laughs> an entrepreneurial business that only began in 2006, so we've never known any other world. And actually it is possible to start a company and grow it to be really quite sizable, even though I compete with much, much bigger companies than mine, and be successful. So I don't think we should be quite so negative. Bronner? Well, I think, you know, if you look at what the London School of Economics Growth Commission talked about last year in terms of what you need to get the UK economy growing, one was skills, innovation and investment were the three big things. Now, on the skills side, I mean, you need basic skills and general education as well as vocational education. But I did think the difference between, you know, the elderly sitting there and the... You, well, elderly, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? The older worker and, you know, the, the apprentice. And you wonder why they haven't, in between, been bringing people through. What happens to those apprentices once they're trained? Where do they go off to? Well, that's a very good question. I don't know if we've got, anybody's got a very good answer. If you have, let me, let me know. But, I mean, it, it, what we will hear tomorrow, almost certainly, is people saying, look at all this good news. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than it was. And one of the things we've been talking about for years is lack of confidence. Can you, can you talk up the economy? In I mean, a good way. I mean, interestingly enough, consumer confidence has really bounced back over the past couple of years. There's a lot of uh, polls by YouGov and Ipsos Mori showing that. Consumers are much, much more confident than they were a few years ago. So our businesses, it's obvious that the economy is doing better in that sense. But the problem is, when you look at the nitty-gritty, when you look at what's actually happening, the big decisions, the big decisions are not being taken. You're not seeing massive corporate investment in this country. Why? Because the returns on investment are too low, because the planning rules are completely messed up. You could generate a lot of sustainable growth, for example, if you allowed the private sector to build a new airport or and, to build more homes. And, 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 yes, all and, those kinds of problems. And to turn to our, to our optimist, um, <laughs> uh, but to many people it doesn't feel like a recovery, does it? Because many, many of us have seen real wages shrinking. Well, I think you know, I run fundamentally a consumer business, and consumers are considerably more savvy than they were a decade ago. But they're also All poorer than they were five years ago. Um, and they're wiser about where to spend their money. And so I think that we should encourage them to gradually grow in confidence. And, you know, there's a reason why value for money businesses like mine, like Primark, are the ones that are really growing, because savvy customers at any income level are choosing value where they find it. How, how fragile do you think this is? Because you, you mentioned low interest rates. And that's presumably, the fragility of it is presumably one of the reasons why the Bank of England has sent pretty clear signals that they're not going to go up anytime soon. Well, I think you need that. I think the biggest issue, and you talked about the consumer and confidence bouncing back, but the biggest issue is that real disposable income, in other words, the money that we've got in our pocket after inflation, is not going up. And in, that's the biggest risk in the second half of the year, that people have been spending their savings and that, you know, as we go into the second half of the year, if they're still feeling poor, then you, you know, they will start cutting back again. Now, I think if you can build on the confidence and, you know, if, you know, unemployment has gone down, you know, we are growing. And so I think if you can get that going, then it can take off. But we're not there yet. And I think the risk is that we have to have low interest rates for a very long time, which makes the structure in the economy even more unbalanced. And, and just to, uh, I mean, you were the most gloomy of everybody here, but this is hardly, I mean, it's not a repeat of the past in the sense that there is no sense of irrational exuberance, is there? No, I mean, there's irrational not... exuberance in one sector, and that's the housing market. House prices, especially in London and South East, are far too high and they're being propped up by the government, and I worry that that's going to be a big problem. The other area of irrational exuberance is low interest rates. People are getting used to the fact that money is very, very cheap. It's been low for so long now that I think it's becoming counterproductive. And that's unsustainable. And I think it's unsustainable, and at some point, rates will go up. There'll be 5%, 6%, and a lot of people 
awful lot of companies will suddenly feel that they can't actually cope. But you're, not, you're not gloomy enough to think that we're going to go into another recession, are you? Not for the moment, no, but I'm very worried it's going to happen in two, three years' time when rates do go up. People are not sufficiently prepared for the day that happens, and that includes a lot of companies. I, I think uh, provided there's people like you willing to remind <laughs> us about being gloomy, there are no companies that I know that are taking for granted what low interest rate looks like, and I don't think there are very many consumers are either. Everyone remembers what it was like, and they recognise that they have to be sensible, and I think that's been a quantum shift in the way that the population has behaved. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you. Now, rescuers are working tonight at the scene of a major train derailment near the city of Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain. The latest